<laughs> so good morning everyone a very warm welcome to today um it's got off to a great start it's great to see all of the panel who you'll be meeting throughout the course of the morning on screen um, right now. Uh, my name is Neil hudson basing I'm the Corporate Events Manager for London South Bank University. And before we start today, I'm just gonna take you through some virtual housekeeping. Um, so just to let you know, we are on Zoom webinar, which means that whilst we cannot see you or hear you, um, you can communicate in the chat box. Um, and it's great to see people doing so already. Please continue to use the chat box to share your introductions, letting us know who you are, what you do, and where you're joining us from. Um, in the absence of seeing you face to face, it's wonderful to know who our audience are. And far from detracting from the event, it actually helps the event to bring the event to life. Um, and we do capture the chat box um, for any interesting points that can help shape future events and activities um, in there. Um, also along from there, you will see the Q&A box. And we'd like to ask you to reserve any questions for the Q&A box. We have an action-packed panel this morning, um, as you'll know, and I'm just gonna pop a link to the program um, in, a vet, um, in the chat box, just so you can re-familiarize re yourself um, with the running order of this morning. However, if you have a question for any of our speakers, please do pop it in the Q&A box. Let us know who your question is for, um, and then our speakers can address that directly. Um, for our speakers that are giving short talks, they will type an answer to you, um, and then for the panel discussion, um, we will be able to address those um, during that time. Um, you can also upvote on the questions you most want answered by clicking the little thumbs up symbol, and that boosts it to the top of the box there. Um, as I mentioned, we are recording the event um, so that it can be shared beyond the event itself and widen the conversation. Um, and we have enabled closed captioning, which are the subtitles that you can see appearing on your screen right now. And um, if you do wish to hide them, um, you can do so by clicking the little up arrow next to CC live transcript at the bottom of the screen. Um, but we do, um, we do enable those in the interest of inclusivity and accessibility. And, and finally, um, just a short statement um, on respect and dignity, whether in person or virtually, LSBU operates an, in, an environment built on equality, inclusion and acceptance. We believe everyone should be treated with respect, dignity and courtesy. Please keep the conversation kind and respectful. We reserve the right to remove anyone who isn't. I'm sure that's not going to be a problem today. Um, so without further ado, I'd like to hand over to my colleague, Professor pa Tara Dean, Provost of LSBU. Tara, over to you. Thank you. Um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on your time zone. As you heard, my name is Professor Tara Dean and I am the Provost at London South Bank University. I am delighted to be here with you at this function at which an important new book on construction economics is going to be launched. I am very happy to have been asked to say a few words to start the book launch. It is extremely pleasing to see so many of you from so many countries have registered to attend the book launch. I welcome all of you to this event and I thank all of you for coming and supporting the uh, contributors. This is one advantage of uh, being able to do the book launches remotely, we can actually invite a wider group and a wider group across the globe can participate. So the research companion to construction economics comprises of 24 chapters, which were written by 24 contributors. It's a book of around 558 pages, actually, and is a major work. The index alone is 20 pages long. Uh, and putting this together is a big achievement. It must have required a huge amount of work. And I'd like to congratulate all the contributors and the editors for producing such a piece of work. I do have a copy of the book in my office and I am waiting for my next one-to-one uh, -one, um, with uh, Professor Ofori to get him to sign the book for me himself. Mm -hmm. So construction provides the basis of all our economic and social activities. It builds our infrastructure and helps to improve the quality of life. 
In research papers and government reports, the economic and social significance of construction is highlighted on a regular basis. For this reason alone, it's necessary for us to have an industry which performs at the best possible level so that the quality of the items it builds is highest, the cost that it builds them is extremely efficient and efficiency in which, with which it delivers its product is also the highest. Even in projects alone, there are other performance parameters such as sustainability performance and the safety, health and welfare of the workers. Then there are issues at the company level such as a healthy markup for the businesses and also uh, matters of the broader strength level, including the upgrading of the industry. Construction economics helps us to understand all these factors and many others. As a stakeholder and beneficiary of the output of construction, my wish is to have an industry which best meets my needs and those of the society as a whole. So personally, I appreciate the work researchers on construction economics are doing. I have to add that the importance of construction goes beyond the economic and social. The recent COVID-19 pandemic and the impact on our mental health and well being as we were confined to our homes brought home to us an aspect of the role of construction. At a conference organized um, recently in November 2021 by our research center for integrated delivery of the built environment. One of the keynote speakers said construction is a major player in public health. With my own health background, I totally agree with her. Despite the importance of construction, I understand that construction economics has not yet been established as a legitimate area of knowledge, and it is not yet recognized as a branch of the mainstream subject of economics. So this book, which contributes to moving construction economics along towards its solid establishment is a highly important volume. George tells me that the chapters of the book were written by some of the top researchers in construction economics in the world. So I'm privileged to be here with the leading lights of the field. I must say that I did do my homework and check the contributors at uh, myself. Not that I don't believe him, but I'm sure you understand as a scientist, I thought I need to verify these myself. Of course, he was right. He's also told me that some of those in the leading group who did not write chapters for the book are taking an active part in the book launch now. So this is a very significant event indeed. I congratulate all the contributors and the editor for this fantastic piece of work. As a researcher myself, I believe you have done a great job to help future researchers in your field. They will find in this book, perhaps all that there is to know in construction economics up to this point. Its main principles, theories and concepts, and its main works. In the chapters, you have also indicated that there is a need for more work. And you have pointed out the possible future directions. Again, as a stakeholder in the work of construction, 
I stand to benefit from these further developments and improvement in this field of knowledge so that it can actually guide practice and government. So I hope this improvement is massive and I wish the researchers in this field success in their efforts. Well, after the hard work in writing the book or a book chapter, it is most pleasing for an author or all the authors to see the book launched successfully. This is what we are here to do. And on that note, I launch the research companion to construction economics, and I wish the book and its authors well. From what I know about the fields of knowledge development, this event will certainly not be the final act of endeavor to build the area of construction economics. If there are any follow-up events, and especially if any of them are in person, then I also like to take this opportunity to extend my personal invitation to you. And I would be most honored and delighted to welcome you to our London South Bank campus. So now it only remains for me to wish you a really beneficial time today and an excellent book launch. Thank you. Thank you very, very much, Tara, for opening our conference today. Um, we will see you shortly. I'd now like to hand over to Katie Crossan. Um, Katie is the geography publisher for the Edward Elgar Publishing in the UK. And Katie has a short statement for us. Katie, over to you. No, oh, thank you. Um, yes, I'll keep this very brief. Um, I just wanted to say how delighted we are to be publishing um, the research companion to construction economics. Um, the book is the first one published in our new series um, of companions to the built environment. I'll mention the second one briefly as the, the panelist is here, I'm Wilson Liu, who edited the Companion to Building Information Modelling with Chimney Anuma, Anuma, which also came out last month. So we're really excited to see um, these books publishing as part of our move into um, developing our list on the built environment and construction management. Um, and I just wanted to say really a big thank you to all of the contributors and especially to Professor Afori for all of your hard work on this project. A book of this length and complexity is no mean undertaking. It's a huge amount of work and I think everyone can agree they've done an absolutely excellent job, which I'm sure will be reflected in the presentations and discussions today. Um, and that's really it for me. We're just look, looking very forward to seeing how the book is received um, in the field in the future. Thank you very, very much, Katie. Uh, thank you for being here today as well. Um, so we now have a series of short talks for you. And as, as, as you'll know from the programme, we have a lot of speakers to get through this morning. Um, and so we are, we are on a time limit, which means our speakers during the short talks, our first, install, uh, first session, have five minutes each. Um, at four minutes, they will hear, hear a bell indicating that they have one minute remaining. Um, and then when we hit the five minute mark, they'll hear the second bell um, and they will be encouraged to wrap up what they're currently saying. So we have a bit of flexibility on time, um, but we've, we've already gone through this. So firstly, I'd like to welcome um, two speakers from University College London. We have John Kelsey and Stephen Gruneberg, um, and I'll hand over to John um, to start. Um, so John, over to you. Uh, thanks very much, Neil. Uh, I'd like to start uh, Hollywood style uh, by saying thanks to Neil and George for the event, uh, to George for his efforts in putting the collection together, and to my co-author Stephen and our fellow authors for all their contributions. Um, in 1972, I completed a degree in economics and philosophy and then went to work on the building site as a labourer. Um, most people thought I was mad. Uh, some still do. Uh, I didn't think that 50 years later I could have co-authored a chapter combining all three uh, topics. Uh, I would have liked another 20,000 words, uh, but I understand the limitations and cost pressures on publishers. Uh, for this reason, there's almost no material in the areas of metaphysics, ontology, critical theory, philosophy of intention, action and decision making, aesthetics, and the human perception and conceptualization of the built environment. 
uh, in the space we have, all we can do is to provoke a degree of critical thought. Uh, so we provide uh, questions rather than answers. Uh, the only one of my philosophy teachers still alive is John McDowell, who's still active at the age of 80 in the University of Pittsburgh. He would probably be horrified at the lack of analytical depth in the chapter, uh, but the chapter was written primarily not for philosophers, but for hands-on construction scholars and practitioners, uh, as per the editorial brief given to us by George. The construction sector faces huge challenges uh, creating new buildings and adapting old ones in response to the pressures of economics, finance, climate change, epidemiological risk um, to which the provost has, um, uh, has uh, referred, um, population growth, human conflict, technological change, and perhaps most importantly, what I would refer to as the dignity of labour. I hope that what we have written will provide at least the beginning of a framework for thinking about our understanding of and ch response to those challenges. Thank you. I'll hand over to Stephen. Thanks. Well, uh, th thanks very much, John. Uh, and again, on behalf of myself and John, thank you, George, too, for inviting us to participate in this volume of work for researchers in construction economics. We begin our chapter by contrasting Locke's benign cooperative world of the social contract with Hobbes' hostile world in his Leviathan, a world that is nasty, brutish and short. Out of this discussion emerge our ethical principles of construction, including a reason for having an efficient industry, producing a quality built output that is itself efficient. We suggest the construction industry has the moral aim of having an excellent reputation that can be valued and trusted by society. Nevertheless, many of the moral issues that arise in the course of a project are a result of the tendering system, whereby the winning, usually the lowest bid, frequently produces a winner's curse, and this pushes at the gates of honesty, quality, and reliability. Because political intervention is constrained, we often expect the market mechanism and the tendering system to solve the problem of distribution and equity. But if anything, the market system exacerbates the problem, leading to both the winner's curse and very low profit margins. The alternative, a managed market, also leads to a maldistribution of rewards and many moral dilemmas. The nature of construction markets means there will be forever moral issues, questions and contradictions to deal with and resolve disputes. We simply lay bare some of the philosophical issues. I now thank you and hand over to the next speaker. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Stephen, um, and, and ahead of time there. So thank you so much. Um, so our next speaker, um, we'd like to welcome um, Jan um, Brockner um, from Chalmers University of Technology in Sweden. So Jan, over to you. Okay. Uh, well, now for 1500 years of construction economics in ancient Greece and Rome, all in five minutes, which is obviously ridiculous. No. Uh, First two questions, why do we know anything about construction economics in antiquity? Now, what do we know? Well, there are basically three sources, inscriptions, literary sources, and archeology span with runes and other remains from antiquity. If we start with the Greek democracies, we have to note that they were audit societies, the earliest audit societies. So there we have construction accounts on marble. That was part of their methods to avoid corruption in public procurement. Now, ancient Rome was, uh, should we say, different. And the procedures were, let us say, um, less transparent. Though we do know something here. And just to take one example, uh, 
about choosing the optimal degree of prefabrication in marble quarries far from the construction site, and how to communicate with the quarry on the other side of the Mediterranean. Now, if we turn to literary texts and um, look at them, what do the authors tell us? I think, I hope that I have caught all good anecdotes, the emperors and cost overruns and varieties of unethical uh, behavior and projects. So th this is not a new thing, what Stephen mentioned, the, the moral issues. So we find Pliny as a provincial governor writing from what is now Turkey, writing to his emperor Trajan and asking for an expert at what the surveyor basically to be sent from Rome to investigate a couple of failed aqueduct projects. And we also have the emperor's reply, Trajan saying that there is expertise in the region and that Pliny should rather look for corruption in these uh, aqueduct projects. And then we have our archaeologists who in recent years have started estimating resource use in ancient construction projects, working from the ruins that we have left. This is probably a piece of Hadrian's villa outside Rome, illegally exported. And, and uh, then we need data. And one important source of cost data is the huge edict by the emperor Diocletian from the year 301, where he tried, tried to set maximum prices and wages across the economy. And that gives us data. Now, it should also be said that the ancients were not much interested in sustainability, but at least they were really good at recycling marble. And now just a final question for all of you to think about. Was ancient Greece and Rome developing countries or not? Hmm. Yes. No. Well, I think I have to stop that. Oh, well ahead of time. So thank you. Thank you very much, um, Jan. So our next um, speaker, I'd like to welcome Professor John Eberhorn um, out from our very own LSBU. So John, over to you. Thank you very much, Neil. Uh, what a pleasure to be in company of uh, so many distinguished um, authorities in construction and construction economics. Uh, many of them as role models, and uh, so many of them have read their work. Uh, the focus of the chapter was sustainability economics and construction industry. What uh, I did here was to take sustainability to its ecological and environmental roots. Although different perspectives exist on sustainable economics, the common thread running through these uh, perspectives hinges on two issues. One, as we all know, the problems associated with economic growth and attendant pollution. And the second, the ch challenges posed to sustaining economic growth in view of insatiable demand on economic and environmental resources on the one hand, and the rate at which the resources upon which construction industry depends is rapidly you know, uh, uh, exhaustible. Are there potential trade-offs? I looked at it, what are these trade-offs and what are the arising concerns that discuss around equity, economic efficiency? And this, I believe, distinguishes sustainability economics, you know, as a unique you know, a discipline and where to go. The intense debate arising from this a centered around whether man-made capital can replace or substitute natural capital. There are two views on this. There are those who say that, yes, it complements. And if that happens, what are the consequences? It means business as usual, the whole concept of weak sustainability. The views that no natural capital services, there are some of them which cannot be substituted by man-made capital, such as what ecosystem services. That being the case, or the concept of strong sustainability, which is you know, held by climate emergency advocates, was also discussed. This being the case, there's a very strong argument of decoupling economic growth from natural resources to reduce natural resource consumption intensity and enhance the absorptive capacity or regenerative capacity of the natural environment, which is critical. 
Now the chapter proceeds to consider the disproportionate uh, uh, natural resources that the construction industry consume, the speed that these natural resources are depleting, the predominant share of the construction industry in total global solid waste generated, and also the huge volume of carbon emissions you know, that are associated with the sector. Now, all concluded you know, to give the, 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 the belief that this debate is very, very critical, and not just critical, but it's also critical to the survival of the construction industry, and it must be had. And so, uh, the, finally, on this, the chapter critically examines the case for adopting very, very strong sustainability approach to construction activities. In doing this, the indirect risks that are posed to natural environment was discussed, as well as to the global ecosystems itself. But also, an important issue that was raised in this chapter is the direct risks to the construction industry itself if it continues with the business as usual or the so-called weak sustainability approach. This is very, very critical because we are seeing the manifestation of the rapid depletion of natural resources on issues of affordability, uh, uh, um, difficulties in finding materials and the the length of time that possible substitutes you know can be produced so using illustrative examples and other case studies so the the, the case for uh, strong sustainability in the built environment was made thank you Thank you very much, John. Um, before we hand over to our next speaker, I would just like to remind you all that if you do have any questions for any of our panel you've seen or the ones coming up, please do pop them in the Q&A box and letting us know who your question is for um, and they will, or they will type an answer for you and we'll have lots of time for more wider questions during the panel discussion later. And um, our next speaker, um, welcome. Um, Soraya Ismail, Director of Research from the Kazana Research Institute in Malaysia. Soraya, over to you. Thank you, thank you. Um, a very good evening here from Kuala Lumpur. Um, first, I'd like to thank um, George and of course, London South Bank University uh, for affording me the opportunity to discuss some of my views um, in this event. Um, I will go straight into the chapter, uh, the comics of housing policy and construction, developing a responsive supply sector and explain briefly the approaches that I have adopted in tackling housing affordability through public policies. Um, Kazana Research Institute, KRI, is a think tank um, funded by the Sovereign Wealth Front of the, the country, Kazana National Berhad. And we do policies uh, to help uh, deepen or underst our understanding of the socioeconomic problems that we have. And we try to give solutions. So um, in my field, uh, what I do is I look into the comments of housing and construction. Um, then I will try, uh, so that's a bit about the, the work that I do here. Um, the motivation um, for this chapter also comes from, of course, um, um, the literature, um, but also comes from my experience of um, leading the research team in Malaysia in crafting the national housing policy for Malaysia um, back in 2016, and it became the, the document. I don't know why they still want me to, to do this because I don't think the housing affordability has been better. But um, from this um, work, um, uh, there's been a lot of uh, requests from other countries as well, uh, namely from uh, the Philippines, um, uh, Pakistan, uh, World Bank and IMF um, to look into this approach. Um, now this chapter is also um, looking into the balancing act of rethinking housing, looking into um, the role of the private sector construction industry, the role of the government in terms of public policy, and the role of um, um, people, uh, society. How could this be used um, as a tool to further democratic practices, as well as ensuring houses are generally affordable to all? Um, so the approach that um, I've adopted, just like a brief one, um, for, for uh, looking into 
um, housing affordability is to look into the supply sector. Uh, because many housing policies um, over the world, I mean, the ones that we look into, uh, try to overcome uh, the problems of severe housing shortages and affordability created by the market conditions. So here we look into the underlying assumptions of utility maximizing households, as well as profit maximizing firms. Um, these, these, these interlink or um, create market inefficiencies such as, for example, speculative purchases, substa substandard housing, um, high vacancy rates, um, and rapid ho um, house price escalation. Of course, with the resultant um, effect of decreased affordability for a significant proportion of society. Housing affordability is, of course, uh, if you use an indicator, it is an outcome of comparing both house prices and rentals with household incomes with a specific market area. So it's looking into demand side policies or strategies and supply side policies and strategies. Now, why is, why is this, uh, why is the sector is different from some of the other approaches uh, being adopted? So in my humble opinion, uh, policy intervention uh, to improve housing affordability based on demand side initiatives tend to concentrate on negotiating prices, house prices, once the house is received by the consumer at the end of the reduction process. So we're not intervening um, before, it's after. This is a base, um, so, so this is based on the notion that government assistance should be given directly to home owners, uh, owners sorry, targeted subsidies who need it. However, in my, in my opinion, um, these measures are unsustainable as they may contribute towards price increase when the supply of houses is relatively inelastic. Demand side interventions appear to accept the relatively inelastic supply curve and are predominantly aimed at enabling consumers to quote unquote afford um, houses as they become increasingly more expensive. So these policies, and you can see this in many countries, um, include the financialization of, of, of houses, commodification of houses. Um, consumers can borrow more uh, for housing in the form of, um, uh, in, the, in the terms of increasing the ratio for loan to house value, or those that subsidize the cost of housing in the form of housing grants. Now, as some evidence suggests, these demand side intervention tend to support and buffer inefficiencies within the supply sector which increase costs for both consumer and government. Now, so the, our approach is, we take a different approach because why don't we go into the supply side strategies? So it's not about devaluing the uh, demand side, but let's look into the supply. Let's make supply more efficient, more efficacious, and more responsive to the, the distribution of uh, home uh, incomes or homeowners incomes before we give grants to demand side, before we give subsidies to the demand side uh, types of, um, of policies. Now, if it follows that if the housing display a relatively inelastic supply curve, um, any increase in the factors of demand will affect a steeper price increase. Therefore, the more elastic, the more elastic, the more responsive the supply curve is, it is more affordable to more consumers. Um, therefore, it is imperative for, so this is straight from the book, yeah, um, to then develop uh, a very um, responsive supply chain or supply side. Um, now, so when, when we look, when we approach it from a supply side, uh, then the problem of inadequate supply is located within the perspectives of both the institutional arrangement and the governance of firms in the construction project coalition. Uh, involves analyzing the national construction business system as manifested by the temporal clustering of firms within the procurement routes. Not one single, I think all of us, I mean, distinguished speakers here and some of them taught me, um, would, would, would know that there are certain specificities in all national business system. No national business system comes from a vacuous context. And, we, and as policy makers, we need to take note of this in order to make sure that some of our policies address the root cause rather than just symptoms of the cause. Um, and, and this is premise, uh, why are we going at the construction sector? Because this is the pillar that created um, the, the housing supply. 
of course, there are other, other variables uh, within it, but let's start from developing a responsive uh, supply side. So uh, this is premised on the view that the improvements in the institutional and governance structures are needed at the project level to increase the responsiveness of the construction industry to supply um, housing need and demand. So that was the approach. Um, and basically uh, we gave, I mean, I gave evidence of, of why the problem persists if we don't take care of the construction industry in order for it to be efficient or efficacious in delivering a responsive supply side. Some firms in that coalition are effective, but if the legalities, the institutional arrangement uh, and the land issues are not done properly, then this is a structural mismatch. And this too needs um, some tweaking in terms of public policy. So an understanding of construction economies is vital in order for us to ensure that housing policies, housing economics uh, are, are, are taken care of properly, structurally. Um, I'll go for my conclusion. I, oh, sorry, I'll go for my conclusion now. Um, so um, the chapter uh, brings forth um, uh, how affordability, affordability could be increased through supply side measures. This is not, again, uh, as I mentioned before, this is not to devalue the importance of demand side measures, but rather to illustrate how supply side approach can foster the creation of a relatively elastic supply curve. Therefore, the quote unquote sequencing, get the supply right first and then do the demand uh, policy intervention. Um, sorry, therefore the sequencing of policy prescriptions between, between demand and supply measures are required for the intervention to achieve its standard aims. Now, the importance of the construction industry to contribute to the housing agenda is deliberated. Here, um, I use a lot of um, institutional arrangement and transaction cost economics. Um, I am a student of MSc Construction Economics and Management um, of UCL back in 96. So as you know, that has impacted me. Um, so, Soraya, um, Soraya, we need to wrap this up now, please. Okay, done. So basically at the end of the day, um, I think um, this is something that um, uh, construction industry economics would help um, other uh, branch of economics to um, ensure that our grounding in the theoretical foundations of understanding how other pieces of the digital puzzle can contribute to a successful um, uh, policy on making housing generally affordable to all, not just a few. Thank you very much. Sorry if I'm taking too much time. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you very much, Soraya. And um, next up, we have Albert Chan. Um, from Hong Kong Polytechnic University. Um, Albert, over to you. Thank you, Neil. Uh, first of all, I'd like to say a big thank you to Professor George Ofori um, in inviting us uh, to contribute a chapter in this book. And i also like to extend our uh, gratitude to uh, South Bank London University in organizing this book launch. The title of our book is called uh, book chapter is uh, Relational Impacts of Con uh, Corruption on the Procurement Process. It's co-authored by Dr. Emmanuel Kingsford Russo and myself. And uh, Dr. Kingsford is uh, our research assistant professor. And um, globally, the economic cause of corruption is estimated to be around US 2.6 trillion, which is more than 5% of the total global gross domestic product. And apparently the infrastructure procurement has been tanked as the most vulnerable process to corruption globally. So the chapter's objectives are then to examine the prominence of the procurement activities to corruption and also to examine the criticalities of the causal factors of corruption and the relational impacts on the procurement process. Corruption can be broadly defined as the bills of power for personal gain in both public and private domains. And in this chapter, we try to look at corruption across the project life cycle from pre-contract stage, over to contract stage, contract administration stage, all the way to post-contract phase. We have identified 
38 causal factors under five constructs, namely psychosocial, organizational, regulatory, project, and statutory. And we also, through the empirical study, found that greed, inadequate sanctions, flawed regulation systems are the leading specific variables leading to corruption. And across the pro project life cycle, we found that you know, um, the most impacted stages of the procurement process include procurement process planning, contractor selection, and awarding contract. So these are the three most severely affected stages. We also found that corruption is negatively correlated with economic growth. And corruption will significantly decrease economic growth and lower growth rates, lower levels of human development, impacts equality and income distribution. And the critical constructs were identified to impact the procurement stages at different stages with the implication that the different stages require different levels of attention. We believe that, you know, um, we've made contribution both to the theoretical community and also to the practical community. Theoretically, we managed to empirically examine the impacts of the causal factors of corruption at various stages of the procurement process. Practically, we managed to develop specific tools to tackle specific causal factors at different stages. So to conclude, the impact of corruption on the procurement process and the relative impact on economic growth have been clearly delineated in our chapter. And it reveals that the stages in the procurement process uh, will lead to different problems of corruption. And this study is intended to inform and facilitate the prioritization of resource allocation in fighting corruption. So I would, um, encourage colleagues to have a look on the book chapter, and we would be very pleased to hear of any comments, feedback, so that we can make further improvement. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Albert, for your, for your talk there. I would now like to welcome Anita Cherich from the University of Zagreb in Croatia. Anita, over to you. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Uh, I would like to say that uh, I had a long cooperation with uh, George and he always supported my work. So this is why it is uh, this a great pleasure for me to write a chapter for uh, this book. We brought together paper on professionalism and the role of trust uh, for CIB conference that was held in 2018 at LSBU. Uh, my chapter focuses mainly on trust in construction project as one of the key strategies for minimization information asymmetry between project participants. As you know, information asymmetry and opportunistic behavior is much more prominent in construction projects than in other types of projects. There are several reasons for that. I will name only a few of them. For example, we have a large number of participants in construction projects that uh, working together over a long period of project duration. Then corruption is more prominent uh, in construction projects than in other types of projects. Also, one important thing is that in construction phase, we have a, a large number of participants and between them, there are no contractual relationships. So in my chapter, I describe also principal agent theory as one of the best application of uh, information asymmetry. I offer framework for, uh, of course, putting that in a principal agent theory framework, how to study different dimensions and different dynamics of trust, because we know that change over the time and the project duration. 
So there are different dimensions of trust, for example, like uh, interpersonal, interfirm, and intrafirm. So we need to build them over the time and between all participants and between project uh, teams and also between companies. Uh, in my chapter, I also suggest that we should study the interplay of trust and reciprocity because building interpersonal and interfirm and interfirm trust become intervened in an intra-project trust. And we need to study that to gain kind of organizational commitment to projects. Uh, this chapter is continuation of my work on trust. And uh, I wanted to emphasize uh, in this chapter how important is this concept in construction management and economics as an academic field. Recently, we have, for example, uh, uh, Academy of Management Review published two special issues on trust. Uh, some publishers established new journals for studying uh, trust. There are uh, different conferences dedicated to trust. So I wanted just to emphasize how this concept is important for construction projects and construction industry as well. Uh, I think that uh, hearing uh, now Stephen what he said about reputation and image of the construction industry, and we wrote something on that on a professionalism and trust, the importance of trust uh, for that CIB conference. I think that trust could help that uh, in changing the image uh, of construction industry. So therefore, I hope that I gain your trust in these couple of minutes. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, um, Anita. Um, so for our next um, two speakers, and let's just bring them up on the screen now. There we go. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, so I'd like to welcome Ni Ankara from Aston University um, and Emmanuel Manu from Nottingham Trent University. Over to you both. And thank you, Neil, and um, thank you, Professor Fori, for the opportunity to contribute to this um, research companion. Now, what Emmanuel and I sought to do in our chapter on construction project economics uh, was to identify matters that are likely to dominate construction project economics in the coming years and to explore the leverage this gives us in influencing mainstream economics. We begin our chapter by situating project economics in its wider context. Our industry interacts with all other sectors through the provision of infrastructure for value creation within um, the economy. And it is the demand for infrastructure that crystallizes in projects which requires the commitment of scarce resources and delivery under conditions of great uncertainty. Efficiency has therefore been historically a key requirement for project delivery, and the body of knowledge supporting this requirement to ensure efficiency has largely focused on providing understanding of cost and value drivers and showcasing tools and techniques that support decision making with the evidence from the literature indicating reliance on conventional techniques and tools forged in mainstream economics. And we do provide a comprehensive review of these tools and techniques in the chapter. We then conducted a, a bibliometric analysis to map out the future direction of the subject area. And this pointed us to increasing attention on non-financial impacts and a trend towards data-driven intelligent tools in order to respond to increasingly complex challenges. And um, significantly, it exposed other emerging trends that could be game changing in the area of construction project economics uh, with significant potential also to influence mainstream economics. And what I'll do now is I'll invite Emmanuel to share a few of these emerging trends with you, as well as um, discuss some of the implications. Yeah, um, <clears throat> thanks very much, um, Ni. Um, so in the chapter, we do uh, discuss how the shift towards you know, maximization of social and environmental value of projects has led to integration of um, social accounting techniques, carbon accounting techniques, and even to understand natural capital accounting techniques um, when it comes to the economic appraisal of projects. 
And um, we also evaluate the influence of uh, circular thinking, for instance, on project economics and how that affects the cost and, and value aspect of projects and how that would continue to evolve in the future. Uh, we discuss how technological advances in the delivery of projects um, when it comes to modern methods of construction and smart, the application of smart digital technologies would continue to further um, provide possibilities for improving cost efficiencies and uh, minimizing the transaction cost uh, of construction projects. And we know that all of these developments would have uh, significant implications for our industry and for construction economics as a, as a a body of study going forward. So we do reflect on, on, on some of these implications. Um, first, we recognize that new metrics will be required for decision-making and, and, and benchmarking, and research would be required to underpin the development and use of such metrics. Um, research would also be required to better understand um, the environmental and social impacts of using, you know, MM, modern methods of construction and smart um, digital technologies um, to improve the way we deliver projects. You know, the uh, access to big data on construction transactions, um, which is increasingly now uh, possible, will drive also, you know, improved project level economic analysis uh, that is supported by uh, artificial intelligence uh, tools and could make construction project economics a, 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 a more recognized sub-discipline of interest uh, within mainstream economics. You know, we also feel that uh, policy changes are going to continue to drive greater internalization of uh, the, the cost of negative externalities are associated with um, construction projects. And, and we are likely to see these changes um, uh, continue across different um, nations over the future. So, I mean, just to conclude, what, what, what we reflect on the fact that, you know, as our projects um, continue to be at the heart of climate change response, our contributions towards understanding of environmental economics uh, offers a very you know, um, good opportunity to gain some recognition from, from mainstream economics. And um, we would like to conclude by inviting you to um, read the, the, the chapter further in terms of the, 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 these arguments that we put forward. And um, please feel free to drop us any feedback comments. And um, thanks also to George for granting us the opportunity to contribute to this research companion. Thank you very much um, to you both. Um, thank you to all of our speakers um, who are contributors to the book um, for giving your short talks this morning. Um, we really appreciate your time and being here. There are some fantastic um, comments and congratulatory messages coming through in the chat box. Um, so I invite you to, uh, to do check some of those out. Um, if you have any questions for any of our speakers that you've heard from this morning, um, please do pop them in the Q&A box, letting us know who your, who your question is for, um, and they'll get round to those to answering those shortly. Um, so for our next um, session, uh, we're going to hear a review of the book by invited experts on construction economics, and we have two guest speakers to do that. Um, our first speaker is Paul Chan, Editor-in-Chief for Construction Management and Economics, past Chair of the Association of Researchers in Construction Management and Professor at Delft Technical University in the Netherlands. So Paul, I'm going to hand over to you. Okay, thank you very much, Neil. I hope you can all hear me. Uh, so thank you also to George for inviting me to uh, give this uh, first review uh, in this session. Uh, George also very kindly invited me uh, many months ago to try to uh, contribute a chapter to this book. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, a combination uh, also of my schedule. And also I felt that I wasn't uh, really an expert in construction economics. Uh, so I felt I wasn't really uh, in the authoritative position to actually write a chapter for this companion. Uh, but I actually read the companion with uh, great interest because uh, it actually covers quite a broad range uh, of the field, uh, and uh, quite rightly so, because uh, there's a lot of complex issues uh, from auditing and accountability, uh, from the procurement and delivery of projects, 
uh, to the kind of um, uh, perspectives from developed countries and developing countries. Uh, and also, of course, when we talk about economics uh, in construction, we also cover different levels and skills. So we have the project level, we have the firm level, we have national economies, and we also have the global uh, picture. Uh, so uh, I congratulate uh, the con contributors and also to George uh, for putting together this companion, uh, because certainly for someone like me who is not an expert in construction economics, I think this is actually quite uh, a nice uh, introduction to the kind of field. Uh, I would also now say that in Construction Management and Economics, which is the journal that I'm editor-in-chief uh, for, uh, we often forget that economics is in the title. So recently, uh, I received an email from a contributor who said, um, I see that you do not publish uh, economics papers. Uh, are you accepting them? And to which my response was, well, we would really love to publish economics papers, uh, except we don't receive them. So that is really my invitation to our colleagues. Uh, please do publish because it's through publishing that we also keep the field alive. Also, if we uh, divert our attention away from research to education, I also realized that in building economics and construction economics, it is not always very easy to get the staff to teach these, these subjects. So perhaps in the preface where Patricia Hillebrand uh, sort of sounded a rather quite a cautious note that perhaps we also need to make sure that the fields of construction economics can thrive. And for the rest of my uh, review, I would like to maybe highlight some parts of the book, which I thought was really quite interesting. Uh, also, this uh, echoes a lot of the points already made by the speakers we have heard today. Uh, and I think these points can potentially help us grow the field of construction economics. So the first thing I would uh, like to maybe uh, draw our attention to is perhaps we should move away from just thinking about supply side perspectives. So I think Suraya Ismail uh, did uh, make a plea that we should concentrate on supply side, but I think by focusing mainly on the project and the building, we actually have a lot of missed opportunities to kind of feedback uh, to the mainstream economics. I think Jared de Valence in his chapter, chapter four, actually said, we need to really engage with conversations that allow us to rethink, <clears throat> rethink the economic models. Uh, and I would actually remind everyone that quite a few years ago in a party, um, I think the Queen of the United Kingdom actually uh, addressed a room of economists to actually say, with all your intelligence, why on earth did you not anticipate the global financial crisis? So I would also say that perhaps the mainstream economics field would need actually some broadening of the way of thinking. Um, so I want to move on to how do we then rethink these economic models? And I really thank the speakers. I think uh, 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 sort of John Kelsey and Stephen Gruneberg, I think in their chapter reminded us of Jeremy Bentham's idea that we should always remember is the greater to achieve the greatest good for the greatest number of people. And uh, right throughout uh, several chapters, I also see, for instance, in Alex Opoku's uh, chapter, chapter 10, uh, we should not leave anyone behind. Uh, and there is also quite a lot on kind of uh, sustainability and social and environmental sustainability. Um, I would also uh, uh, go to the chapter by uh, Jan Brockner, because I really found the um, Aristotle's uh, investigation really interesting, because in Aristotle's uh, investigation of why tyrants engage in major projects, um, Aristotle suggested that those in power are trying to keep everyone poor so that they don't rebel. Uh, so my question is, to what extent is the building industry actually complicit in actually helping these tyrants? Um, so I would like to leave with perhaps a couple of uh, ideas of where we can move further. Uh, and to this, I would draw on Edmundo, Werner, and Jeroen Kling's uh, chapter. I think that's chapter 16, where they actually said that construction economics has largely focused on the kind of industrial market structures and we forget about the kind of the people who actually built these cities. 
uh, within that chapter, I thought there is really quite a nice call to try to engage much broader from the project-based uh, construction to engage in conversations with, let's say, urban economics. And I really like this idea that cities are, can be viewed as territorialized networks of construction. So maybe we need to start thinking at a more systemic level, multi-scale level, because otherwise we will keep focusing on externalities and then we will actually try to be quite risk averse in managing those externalities. So I would like to see actually more conversations around, for instance, Ni and Emmanuel talked about circularity um, and also perhaps uh, the elephant in the room, which is the financialization of construction. You know, who are kind of buying these properties and what kinds of markets are they kind of driving? So my final conclusion is that I think we still have a lot of space to encourage conversation. And perhaps we need to increase those dialogues across different spaces. So construction, urban economics. But I also wonder maybe conversations between management and economics so that we can actually learn those economic models and see how they are put to good use in management. And perhaps in a few years time, I would feel capable to contribute a chapter. Thank you. Paul, thank you so much for being here today um, and for your talk, we really appreciate it. I'd like to hand over to our next speaker. Um, I'd like to welcome K.H. Asanti. Asante. Um, K.H. is the Chair of the International Cost Engineering Council and past President of the Ghana Institute of Surveyors. So over to you, sir. Thank you very much and uh, good morning, everybody. And all protocols duly observed. I'm indeed delighted to be part of uh, the launch of this book at the London uh, South Bank University, which actually explores the range of topics featured in the publication and edited by our own and renowned Professor George Ofori, Dean of the School of Build Environment and Architecture. From the program, we may hear and listen as we are doing to experts from academia, research, and industry. And here, I must thank George for the opportunity. I see and value the book, Research Companion to Construction Economics, as a very important addition, not only to research and academia, but to industry. The book comprises 25 chapters and from information provided, written by leading researchers throughout the world. What is very, very interesting to me is how it discusses the history of construction economics, its present state, and the future for further development. I must indicate that the language flows the philosophy and the chapter on practice, practice in antiquity is very interesting. From industry perspectives, the contents are adequate, not only as a research companion, but as a practice companion. And I will not hesitate to recommend to anyone in practice in academia. In fact, time and location for review could not allow the presentation of a summary of chapters and debates on key topics suffice to note that engineering economics seem to be emerging with gusto coming from international cost engineering council perspective and the Ghana institution of surveyors with practices in cost engineering quantity survey project management and project control in the case of cost engineering the approach is on process and time schedules with costs or price books as the reference point. Whilst quantity surveying dwells on quantitative time schedule and price with project management on time schedules and activities. And finally, project controls on planning, scheduling and documentation. It is in this event that I am particularly enthused to the contents of the book, especially on George Ofori's chapter two on construction economics, the origins, the significance, the career status, and need for development. 
Series chapter three on the philosophy of construction economics. John's chapter five, construction economics in antiquity. Very, very interesting. And my own Alex, chapter 10, construction industry and sustainable development goals, which I can inform Alex that about two weeks ago, the National Development Planning Commission in Ghana decided to look at construction industry and it fixed in sustainable development goals. And a book that you contributed to critical role of the construction industry was well noted at that conference. I also looked and appreciate Oba's chapter 11 on sustainability economics and the construction industry. Rick, chapter 13, on measuring and comparing in construction costs in different locations, methods and data, where the International uh, Cost Engineering Council is looking at locational costs and prices. Anita, I enjoy the economics of trust, construction industry, because integrity is very important in our industry. Bondo and um, Giron, chapter 16, on the builders of cities. And we have just been told, building cities are just a whole range of construction processes going on. And I believe the prospects for synergy between labor and build environment will be well uh, noted. I'm also very happy with Chimes and uh, Esther's uh, chapter 23 on economic considerations in the procurement and deployment of construction informatics application. And finally, George's own chapter 24, the future new directions and construction economic research. Ladies and gentlemen, permit me to state that upon review of key and topical contributions made us reference about, I can confidently note that this book is a research and practice companion to construction economics. At the basic level of construction economics is the rich buildup that quantity surveyors engage themselves in to price their bills of quantities to arrive at tender sums and ultimately contract sums. Rate buildup in, involves input resource utilization studies through operational research and analysis in terms of labor, goods, materials, equipment, plant and equipment, and analysis for profit and overhead. Other aspects of it is market surveys and collation of prices are key to the process. Here, output constants are thereby arrived at that become very effective as against any rule of the top. It is at this basic level too that cost data are picked to work out coefficients and weights for various formula methods for increased cost calculations for the amounts payable to contractors as adjusted for rises and falls in the cost of labor rules and other inputs to work. Further, data at this level permits assessment and analysis of price, costs, establish price reasonableness and value for money to bring integrity to the construction industry. It will be worth to research into quotations for infrastructure projects that in my opinion now dwells more on outdated benchmarks, metrics, and mostly markups. In conclusion, this is where cost engineering, project management, and project controls are fast approaching quantity This I will ask the contributors to look at. I thank you for your kind attention, and thank you, Professor Ofori. Thank you very much, KH, and to, and to Paul. Um, great to hear from you both. Um, we are now going to go over to our panel discussion. Um, and to start our panel discussion, um, he's going to be chairing it. I'd like to welcome Jim Meikle, Honorary Professor at UCL um, here in the UK. Um, Jim, I'm going to hand over to you to introduce the panel discussion um, and our speakers. Thank you, Neil. 
Uh, good morning to everyone in the UK. Good evening to everyone in Australia and New Zealand. And good day to everyone in between. I'm speaking from Drysdale on the Ballerine Peninsula in southern Victoria, and the sun went down here two hours ago. I'm Jim Nico. I'm a former partner of Davis Langdon, a long term associate of the Construction Management and Economics Group at University College London. And I'm now an applicant for permanent residence in Australia. Many thanks to the earlier speakers and to George and the publishers for putting this volume together so efficiently and so quickly. I was very sorry that Dr. Hillebrandt can't be with us today. She was largely responsible for starting this whole construction economics thing off and introduced me personally to the subject in Egypt more than 40 years ago. It's good to see old friends and colleagues, to see faces to put a familiar name to, and to see some new people, at least new to me. It seems that the field of construction economics is not so small after all. I spent some time over the last week looking through the companion, and I can see many hours ahead of more reading. It's thought provoking and challenging. The book is indeed a companion. I've read chapters, learned something new and interesting, but also been signposted to other reading and parts, perhaps even some new research. This part of the event is for our panel of experts to address questions from our audience. We have around 20 minutes for questions, so we must make the best use of that. Neil from South Bank will read out questions and I will direct them to members of the panel. I will also take the opportunity of asking some questions myself. But maybe first, I'll ask each of our experts to introduce themselves, provide a quick comment on George's book, and perhaps give an opinion on what next for construction economics. Each panel member can have a couple of minutes, and I'm told that will be strictly controlled. A panel of experts consists of Les Ruddock, a fellow honorary professor of mine at UCL, Gerald de Valence from UTS in Sydney here in Australia, Samuel Larrea from the University of Waters Rand in South Africa, and Wilson Liu from the University of Hong Kong. Can I start with a few words with Les? Thank you. All right, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jim, for that jolly introduction. Um, for those of you that don't know me, I think my main claim to fame is that I am the leader of the CIB, the International Research Council. Um, for um, research and innovation in construction. And I lead the construction economics group. Now, as the leader of that group for the last decade, I'm quite aware of what appear to be the main interests of researchers in this field. And it seems to me that over the last few years, the main interest has been in the issues of productivity in the industry, skills and training and education, and obviously environmental climate issues and IT issues. So these appear to me looking at also um, journals such as Paul's journal. Paul mentioned that the reason that people perhaps sometimes indicate there's not enough economics in his journal is that people don't supply papers. There doesn't, doesn't appear to be the same volume of research in economics as there is in the management aspect. And speaking to previous editors, it's always been the same complaint that perhaps for every 10 papers that are on the management field, construction management field, only one is in the construction economics. Perhaps it's not even as good as that nowadays. But certainly it's been a much neglected area, even though it's, we consider it perhaps still a growth area. As far as the CIB is concerned, Building economics was something that spun off from management about, what, 20 years ago, and that developed into construction industry economics. And construction industry economics basically um, concerned with two areas at the time. One was cost studies, and the other was the industry national economy relationship. Now, I've been looking at recent papers that we've received, and there does seem to be a decline in um, some of these areas, particularly cost studies. So what construction economics means is 
a real plethora of different subject areas. I have just been looking at a book that I um, edited, similar book to George's, called Economics for the Modern Built Environment, 12 years ago. And several of the chapter providers for George's book provided chapters for this book, notably Jan Bruckner, Gerard de Valence, Stephen Grunberg, for instance. And it's interesting what their perspective was 10, 12 years ago. Um, data, the need to improve data for the industry was something that Stephen Grunenberg was discussing in his chapter. And maybe that's still a major issue. Um, integrating models with on construction issues. That's, I think, something Gerard concentrated on. And a very interesting chapter was by Jan Bruckner, who was looking at the new construction, um, new construction and built environment areas. So Jan Bruckner was looking at how things have changed in the relationship between the industry and the economy, what the future issues would be. And this is now a very interesting chapter, considering how little seems to have changed in the last 12 years. Um, and so my main, my main conclusion of the book um, so far is that it's an excellent reader, an excellent contributor to research areas. What I would hope now is that maybe George will take this forward and consider what the other issues for the next 10, 20, 50 years are going to be and how they're likely to change. Thanks. Thanks very much, Les. A um, few words from you, Gerard? Oh, a few. Um, all right. Well, control <laughs> yourself. <laughs> yes. Um, well, you know, firstly, of course, um, uh, you know, congratulations to George and the team at Elgar. Um, you know, the volume is uh, uh, beautifully produced, I've got to say. You know, I was really impressed by the amount of effort that went into it. And I think it is a real landmark. Um, you know, if you, you read uh, George's introductory chapters or what Les was talking about, uh, the previous publications, the thing that's been, one thing that's been difficult for people who are interested in construction economics is to find the material because it's, it's been spread out across journals and books and conference papers and the great achievement i think of the research companion is to bring together in one place what so far is a definitive work on construction economics and one could always you know, debate whether a topic has been left out or some topics perhaps have been included. You know, these, the, you know, the, these are always open for, for, for discussion. But the key point here is that for the first time, we have a definitive collection of construction economics works. And it defines the, it defines the field in a way that no other work has done previously. And I completely agree with Liz. What we've achieved to date is really a basis for what we want to do over the coming years. And there is lots of work to be done. I mean, that's clear from the chapters in the volume. Many of the, many of the chapters are establishing a foundation of work that's been done, the research that's been done over the last few decades, consolidating that in order that we can move forward. We can build on the themes, we can identify the key points, we can develop the tools and techniques that we need in construction economics in order to make it far more useful and far more applicable. So that's what I think the, the book has done for us. I think, that, I think it's given us a a real marker, you know, staking the ground. And it, I hope, will actually bring a lot more attention to previous work. So uh, Les mentioned his, his book on economics, the modern built environment, uh, which really was the first of a whole series of, of works that have come out over the last decade or so, um, including 
these three books that have been edited by Jim Meikle and Rick Best. There's Stephen Grunenberg, Noble Francis's books. There's a uh, uh, Christian Brockman has a book coming out this year on construction microeconomics. So we're seeing a lot more um, uh, research being published, but it's not being published in the journals. And I think that's a really interesting question about why that uh, is not why that is the case. But the um, the publication through the books and with the support of the publishers like Elgar and Routledge have really seen a significant body of work accumulate over the last decade or so. And I regard the research companion as like a capstone for all of that. It brings together the themes, identifies clearly the work that's been done, and importantly, provides signposts and directions for where we might take our research in the future. So, you know, I, I, I've got to say, I'm only halfway through the book, but I've been enjoying it immensely. I, I hope to live long enough to finish it. <laughs> and uh, I think the, um, the would be very, very good if we could try to use the book as, and the, the launch, the event we have here, to build a bit, bit, a bit more of a community. You know, one of the, one of the problems that people uh, who work in the field, work in construction economics have, is we tend to be isolated. We're spread out over a lot of institutions rather than having departments and a, a group of people together on um, you know, a, a location, a single location. Because it's a, honestly, it's a bit of a niche interest, you know, in terms of numbers. And uh, I think that way uh, would be very helpful if we could find ways to communicate and coordinate our, uh, our research uh, more effectively. And I'm really hoping that uh, the, the launch of the research companion might be the start of that as well. Yeah, so anyway, congratulations to everyone for the, the work here. Thanks very much, Gerald. Samuel, can I ask you to say something? Um, yeah, thank you very much, um, Jim. I think I am um, naturally um, have to begin um, by thanking um, very much Professor Dolufuri um, for inviting me um, to be part of this. Samuel, we are losing you. Samuel, we are losing you slightly. Your connection's a little bit off. If you um to preserve um, some to preserve some of your bandwidth, it might be worth turning your camera off. Okay. Um, is it better now? Can you hear me better now? We That's can. much better, can. Samuel. Ah, okay. Okay. Um, <laughs> sorry, you've got you've gone again. You, you've in got, South you've, Africa. Sorry, Samuel, you've gone again slightly. Um, okay, so I'm just going to take my time. Um, yeah, please, hope, do, please um, do. Yeah, there's, there seems to be a general network problem this morning, so I'm sorry about that. No, it happens. Okay, um, so I'm just going to carry on. Um, <laughs> and um, if there's a problem, please just let me know. Um, but um, the point that I was making is um, I thank um, you know, Professor Fori um, for to be part of this. Um, it's a good book. Um, I think. Um, and Gerald um, have said a lot already. There is no need to repeat what you've said, but I just want to um, support you know, some of the key points from that. Um, I think building the community um, is important. Um, I think this is a really good foundation upon which we can build to develop the field of construction economic going forward. Um, and I think that in terms of moving forward also into the future, I think this goes with a great opportunity um, to begin, I think, to consolidate in some of our thoughts and our research in this area to begin influencing a mainstream thinking and theories um, you know, I mean, within the field of construction economics, but also um, beginning to get into the mainstream and um, field of economics um, as well. Um, the other thing I wanted to just say um, to wrap up is I do agree completely um, with um, um, Mr. K. Josas Sanzi, who did talk um, about this, you know, I mean, not just being a research um, companion, but a practice companion as well. I have found a lot um, of the content I've read so far 
um, useful, um, not just from a research angle or perspective, but also from a practice and um, perspective. And so um, thank you um, very much, um, Jim. Thank you, Samuel. Um, is that it? Yes. Wilson, can I ask you to contribute yes. a few words? Yeah, thank you, Jim. Thanks I very much. I saw a few uh, faces from the old time uh, reading, including Stephen and also Samuel and so many other faces. Actually, I'm rather disappointed. Can I, I cannot see Helen Brand today because I read her book mm -hmm. when she published, uh, uh, was a lecturer at Reading. Uh, but uh, since then, I've never met her, although I heard about a lot from uh, uh, George, from other people, about uh, her contribution to this field. And then uh, I, when I was in Reading, I was quite interested in uh, international construction, you know, reading a lot of researchers there. And then I, I came back to Hong Kong uh, around 14 years ago. <clears throat> I gradually, I actually deviated from the international construction, not because uh, Hong Kong uh, uh, is not international, Hong Kong uh, is rather international, and the construction market is also very international, but Hong Kong people are very much uh, inward looking, perhaps because the market is too uh, profitable. So they don't have time to look outside of the market. Uh, and then uh, we, when I came back to the, this part of Asia, at that time, George uh, was in NUS. So we almost met every year in NUS, in Beijing, actually in Reading as well. So. Uh, when he approached me uh, uh, to write this chapter, I feel much honored. Um, so in this chapter, I basically talked about some, uh, the global construction market. So I had some uh, scope definition first. Uh, this part of the work is very much inspired by uh, peers, uh, Professor Andy Dante, Professor Roger Flanagan and Carol Ju. And then uh, I try to describe the uh, some uh, the historical development, status quo, and try to kind of uh, uh, look at the future of the construction uh, market. So uh, I keep a close eye on Stephen's uh, uh, work on the the data about international construction. So uh, in in that part, I, I described some some trends, some patterns of the international construction markets. And then uh, uh, I see that the international construction market uh, actually at a crossroads, okay. So, um, but then, um, yeah, so last thing, uh, 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 very complicated in the chapter, but just some, some viewpoints, some, some kind of my thinking. Uh, so uh, Jim asked us to think something about uh, about economics. Nothing uh, uh, particularly about economics, uh, but uh, if if we think of construction economics or uh, economics itself, should it be too complicated? Okay, that's something should be uh, we we mobilize, we use in our daily life. Okay, if in that sense, I think we we do contribute something to uh, 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 construction economics. Thank you, Jim. Thank you very much, Wilson. I'm now going to pick a question of mine and I'm gonna ask you, Les. I was interested that, you know, you referred back to your, the book that you edited and I think you said 12 years ago. I mean, I'm interested looking at some of the chapters in, in George's book that things like the Latham and Egan reports are still being cited as major sources. Are there analyses and prescriptions still relevant, do you think? Um, that's, a, that's a very good, very good question, Jim. Um, I don't often see references made to these reports anymore. So maybe, maybe in that context, um, They've gone as far as they could go in describing the issues with, with the industry. Um, 
I, I don't think that the, I think a major issue with the industry is it's often perceived as being relatively backward compared to other sectors. Yes. And the movements seem to be incredibly slow and major changes, major changes in practices don't seem to rapidly, rapidly occur. So maybe it is true that you could look again if you asked people to undertake similar sort of studies, Latham and so on. The conclusion would be not a lot of progress, not a lot of progress. Um, but nowadays, of course, concerns are with other other issues. Mm. I mean, the, the, a lot of the papers that I've seen now coming in to um, CIB, for instance, are concerned with post-COVID. How do we... Yeah develop the industry post-COVID, what are the major issues? And of course, environmental factors. But as, as far as, as far as I'm concerned, maybe slow progress is the answer. So it's on the back burner, still on the back burner. Yeah, thank you, Les. Neil, are you going to come in with questions now? Uh, please feel free to go and ask another. Go ahead and ask one of yours and then I'll come in with one afterwards. Okay. Wilson, can I ask you, I'm really interested in the role and the operations of Chinese contracting firms internationally. I mean, what can we learn from the way that they are now operating? I mean, they now dominate the ENR league tables. They're everywhere. What can we learn? Yes, uh, that's something uh, phenomenal. When uh, in 1985, there was only one Chinese international yeah. contractor on that list. But now, yes, in top 10, you see a lot of uh, uh, Chinese companies. I, yeah, observe this quite a, quite a bit. I think it's, uh, uh, sometimes you, you can contribute to Chinese. Uh, they, they are willing to to sacrifice uh, their time and working environment to work some relatively harsh uh, construction sites. And then the um, economic development in mainland China um, perhaps provide some, some uh, uh, more complicated, complicated market for them to grow their, their strengths. And then they expand to uh, almost everywhere. Um, and so um, I think uh, the, the government is playing a role behind that. So for example, like in 1998, they, they have done a strategy, and then recently, obviously, uh, the one built one world. So I think uh, companies and working with the uh, government play a, an important role. Uh, in their place. Thank you. Thanks. Gerard, can I ask you, generally, do you think that construction quality has improved, is improved in recent decades? And if so, what are the main reasons? Is it processes, products, supervision, regulation? Um, oh, uh, oh, I'm not sure I can answer that, Jim. <laughs> well, um, do you think, do you think me, quality has improved? Well, no, I'm, there's a lot of different buildings. I mean, you know, we, we have a lot of uh, highly improved uh, components and products that go into buildings. Mm. Um, but, you know, in, in Australia, if you build a detached house today, under the current code, the building code, that house only has a lifespan of 25 years. But it complies. But that's, you know, that's not a very long lifespan for a, for a building um, in most countries. Um, so compared to a, you know, brick and tile home that was built 50 years ago that would probably last for hundreds of years. A modern house might have a lot more um, in it. They might have uh, services like air conditioning, heating, entertainment systems and so on that, 
the previous house didn't have, it might be much larger and have a, a lot better um, you know, appliances. So we could, you know, you, on one side, you can argue qualities improve immensely. You know, we now build houses with washing machines and solar panels and all the other bits and pieces that are part of the, the package. But the actual structural work that goes into that house is much worse than it used to be. Mm -hmm. That's, and I think that's probably not uncommon in a lot of countries, not, not everywhere, but not uncommon. Um, the other side of that coin, I think, in commercial uh, and industrial building, I think the quality today is much better than it was even a, uh, a decade ago, or certainly a couple of decades ago. Um, you know, if you watch a uh, watch concrete pours on a high rise site now, they're really, you know, they you know we have that down to a fine art, and we can specify the concrete. The grades, the strength, you know, its 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 capacity to a very fine degree, as well, and we can put up buildings that are ten or a hundred stories high, and we can do that quite safely. So these are major achievements. So the I guess the point I'm trying to make here is that quality, you know, it's a bit, trying to define quality is a bit like trying to define an elephant. You know, if you're the blind man in the room. We all have a, a different aspect of it, and we all think that we're, we've got the whole story. But you know, the problem is, we could just be a few people wandering around with a in a room with a bucket and a mop and a and a hat stand, and we think we found an elephant, right? So, my my, my answer there is that I, I think the industry's capability is greatly improved. It can deliver much higher quality buildings. And some of the major projects over the last couple of decades, you know, the um, uh, you know the bridges in um, northern Europe, the um, uh, high rises in the Middle East, um, the buildings in places like Shanghai, Taipei, you know, quite amazing. Yeah. So my my short answer is I think the building does do the industry does much better in delivering quality buildings than yeah. it used to. But the industry will deliver to the required standard. Yes. And the role yeah. here, the, 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 I cannot emphasise how important I believe the role of standards and codes are in improving the industry's performance. And, um, you know, my, my these days, actually, you know, that if... Um, I was, if you ask me what my preferred policy approach to the industry would be, I would be asking governments to spend a lot more money on the research and testing required in order to get the standards improved and to create much higher quality buildings through that mechanism. Because I think that's how the industry works. The industry responds to regulation because it's a highly regulated industry. So... If we want to, you know, decarbonisation, great example, right? We want to decarbonise buildings, change the standards, insist on yeah. low carbon cement, insist on replacing Rio with graphite or composites. Just to jump in, just to just to jump in there, we are quite we are running tight on time. We've got one question for Samuel, and then we've got a big audience question. Um, there are some okay. questions in, in the kit and comments in the Q and A box. And um, so do feel free to reply to those. But Jim, one question for Samuel, and then we'll come over to a big uh, wider panel question. Okay, Samuel, one of the things that I've been thinking about for a long time, and we're doing it again tonight, of talking about construction being a single industry. And I have a problem with that. And I think it treating it as a single industry tends to obscure issues and problems. And I'm thinking here about Productivity, you know, productivity for construction isn't really helpful. We need to have it sector by sector. Similarly, things like modern methods of construction. I just wondered what you thought about that. Yes, I mean, I think it's a good point. Um, and I think that it is good, you know, I mean, if we can segmentize it um, you know, I mean, across the industry by having um, just a single measure across the industry. Um, I also don't think it's appropriate just because of the nature um, of working these um, different segments um, of, the, um, of the construction industry. But generally speaking, I think that productivity 
um, has become a really um, important um, issue um, across the industry, um, especially um, in the last two years, you know, I mean, where a lot of sites have not been able to operate in the way um, that they would have you know, I mean, preferred um, to operate. Um, and so, um, yes, I think that the idea of local activity, you know, I mean, in different segments of the industry um, is, um, is, is the right idea. Okay, thank you. Uh, Neil, can okay. I go back to you? Of course, of course. So um, I'm going to ask everyone to keep their answers brief to a couple of sentences, and this is going to be quite difficult, but please try. Um, so in a nutshell, what is the future of construction economic studies and practice? And how can we develop construction economics further? Uh, Gerard? Huh. Mm, well, You've I think about the future this. will be similar to the past, <laughs> to a large extent. You know, the, um, there's, it doesn't, the challenges in front of the industry are pretty clear. Sustainability, you know, equality, access, qual, you know, productivity. Uh, there's no mystery about the agenda. The, um, so I would actually answer both questions with a similar kind of answer, you know, a similar point that what we need to do is to pursue the issues that we've identified and to develop the tools and techniques needed to do the research. And that's the future. The, the future is doing that work. Yeah. Thanks, Joe. Can I, can I uh, just come in, Jim? Yes, um, of course. I'm looking to the fairly immediate future. And I think that in a lot of countries nowadays, the appreciation of the construction industry is in fact improving because in order to reflate the economies, in order to now promote the much needed economic growth after the decline in many economies due to COVID, I think that now the industry will be looked at in more, more interest by governments, by, by other industry sectors, because it is going to play an important role, perhaps perceived as being a more important role in the next few years than, than um, ever before in recent times. As a way of reflating economies, as a way of developing economies quickly, it's certainly going to be playing a major role. Thanks, Wes. Neil, you got another? Um, well, let's hear from those who haven't answered. Sorry? Uh, we can we can hear from those who haven't answered. Okay, Samuel. Yeah, I mean, thank you. So, um, I mean, my answer is um, exactly along the lines of what Gerald said. So, I think it's really you know um, increasing our ability to deal with the current big issues you know, I mean facing us. So, it's really um, around developing the understanding, the tools, the techniques, the theories to confront um, the big issues that currently face us. Mm -hmm. And Wilson. Yes, I would like to follow Les's point. Uh, actually, uh, uh, just just love our construction industry because it provides a so rich context for us to to look at any of the big issues of construction economics. Uh, so uh, I, I I also sometimes I talk to some other so called mainstream uh, economists. I I don't feel any need. I actually have a problem to to align us into mainstream economics because we are in a such a fortunate and the rich context of looking at this issue. Okay, thanks. Um, many thanks to questioners and the panel members. Um, one thing I'd just like to say that picks up on comments by Les and uh, Gerard is that I suggested to George that we should ask the community to reflect on the topics in this volume and that we should come together again in a few months to discuss and debate, and debate in a considered way issues raised by the book. It would be good to identify topics that have not been covered or not been covered in as much detail as they deserve or need. Um, and it would be good to air alternative views on some topics. A number of earlier speakers have encouraged feedback on their papers. I've discussed this idea with George and he's supportive. I'd be interested in your thoughts on the idea of a reunion. And if you think it's worth pursuing how it could be arranged, 
And I think the best thing there is, you know, an email to George, just, is this a good idea? How could we go about it? Um, back to you, Neil. Thank you very much, everyone, for your engagement, for your questions and your thoughts and comments for a lively chat box. There are lots of questions coming through, which obviously at the moment we don't have time to answer. Um, the chat box and the Q&A box are both recorded. They do inform future activity. And as Jim has just said, um, we can look into some of the themes that have arisen um, and maybe address those in the future. But that's all from me. George, I'm going to hand over to you for closing remarks and for thank yous. You're just on mute there, George. Okay. Thank you very much, Neil. And, um, uh, you know, it's been a fantastic morning and I shouldn't take too much time. But I'll make one request. And the request is this, that um, all of us here who um, actually spoke, I, I saw we have all written something. And so, can I suggest that we, we compile what we have written here, uh, you know, written to, pre to present here into um, a, a small document? Okay, so I'm going to write to you, each of you, to ask you to just send me, with no further addition to it, just send me what you wrote that you presented here today. That's all. And I'll put it together into something that we will think about what to do next. Um, I've written a speech but it would take too long to read it. And so I, I will just, just, just want to uh, say this, that I will send it to everyone who came here today, uh, the, the speech also not amended in any way, just the speech as it was. Okay. Well, well, the point that um, Jim has just highlighted is what I, I want to uh, you know, discuss with you. And, and this, is, this is it. So, so he, he referred me to uh, the PS, Commission report. It was a report done in the UK on the UK consulting industry, 2003. 2004, they did a, a colloquium on it. And so he and I were discussing the possibility of following um, the book with a colloquium. And so um, in doing a colloquium, what, what is actually done is that number of people are invited to write a particular pieces that these pieces are discussed during the, the, the meeting that is held. Okay, so I'll be, I'll be writing to you. Expect a note from me, um, anyone who is here, um, about maybe looking at some of the chapters in the book and, and, and responding to them. We, we, we will think of how to do it, but um, I think this is something that we can actually, um, uh, you know, and actually do. Let, let me just say a few sentences. The first sentence is this, that I want to say a very, very big thank you to all my colleagues. In this case, my colleagues are the contributors to the book. I've heard here today George's book. It's not my book. It's a book written by a number of colleagues, you know, for whom and with whom I actually had the honor to be the editor of a book. So it's a book written by um, some of the researchers in construction economics, and it's a book that we hope actually contributes to the field and enables the field to move forward. I think it, um, you know, as we have heard here today, I think it's something special, and I will request that we build upon it. And this is why I think a colloquium following that uh, is something that we should be wanting to do. Why did I put myself through this trouble? Um, because I've done um, compilations of books before and it's a very, very painful exercise because people just don't follow instruction. And it, you know, it takes a long time to actually do it. And so I'd said no, and I wouldn't do it again. But um, Elga was very persuasive, um, especially Daniel Mehta at Elga was very persuasive. So he suggested that um, you know, I do it and they offered me a lot of help. And they actually came through with a lot of help. And so later on, when I send you this, you will, you will um, you see what I actually meant to say. But one of the reasons why I, I put myself through that trouble was a question somebody asked me. I was eat, quietly eating lunch and the person asked me this question. What is the philosophy? After I'd been introduced to him, he asked me this question. What is the philosophy of your field? All right. Now I had thought about it. Sorry, I had to think about it at that point and I had to give him an answer. I gave him an answer, it took about five minutes, maybe 10 minutes to give him the answer. He was very impressed. He didn't pursue it uh, because I think he didn't know what to ask. And so let us all think, think about this. 
what if we are caught and we ask, in fact, what is construction economics? What shall we say? I think we should be able to uh, give an answer. And this answer will only become clearer in future because at the moment it takes not. So let us all work together to, you know, to deliver this answer in future. So I thank all of you, all the contributors. I thank everyone who actually attended uh, this, this session. Um, for me, it's been very meaningful and um, we could have gone on maybe for a whole day, but let's, let's do that in the colloquium. Okay, um, in, in being the editor of this book, I dedicated it to my children. I have four children. And so this book is dedicated to them. I think one or two of them, two or three of them are here with us um, in, in, this, in this session. All right, it, my family has enabled me to do a lot of things and I thank them for providing me with that kind of support. I have seen some of some very old students and I've seen some very new friends also today. Let's all work together. Let's try and bring um, the area of construction economics forward. I see ARCOM, the Association of, Association of, Association of Researchers of Construction Economics. Oh, sorry, construction management. There isn't an association of researchers of construction economics in the UK. There is the, you know, the group that have less leads, you know, the CIBW 55. Now let's just make it perhaps the most prominent in the CIB. Let's do the best we can to, you know, uphold and improve and develop the area of um, work called construction economics. I would speak for the whole day, but let me say thank you again to all of you and let me end here. So Neil, over to you. Thank you very much. Thank you very, very much, everyone. Um, as I say, we have recorded this session. It will be shared with everyone who registered, um, regardless of whether they attended or not. Please do feel free to share it um, with anyone you feel might benefit from listening um, or interested. Um, doing so helps bring these conversations to a much wider audience than just beyond today itself, and that obviously have a much wider impact. Thank you all, and we'll be in touch soon. Thank you. But Neil, let me have the last word. Um, I think you will all agree with me that Neil has done a fantastic job. So big, big thank you to Neil. Uh, teamwork. Thank you so much. <laughs> Take care, everyone. Thank, thank you, Neil. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thank you all. Take care. Bye. 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 Bye.